Outlaws of Thunder Junction is right around the corner, and there are far more vintage playable cards than the average standard set. Let's take a look. Welcome back, Vintage Gamers, to a special video. Uh, I have been perusing the Outlaws of Thunder Junction spoilers, and I have found that there are more cards to be interested in for Vintage than in most standard sets. So today, I think I'm going to go through all the cards that piqued my interest, or cards that I've heard talked about, uh, and go over what I like, what I don't like about them. Uh, this isn't going to say that cards in this list are going to be played in Vintage, um, some of these cards might only be played by me for content, um, but if they're mentioned here, they're probably either somewhat talked about within the community, or I think there's something you can do with them that's powerful enough to be worth talking about in Vintage. And actually, for a standard set, like I said, I have like 15 or so, maybe 20 cards here. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. This isn't a Modern Horizons, this is a standard set, so let's get right into it. Um, this is the big one, I think, most people are talking about. Jace reawakened the new two-mana Planeswalker. Now, two-mana Planeswalkers in Magic are historically very good or very bad. Uh, which one does this fall under? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, it's blue, so that's a good start. <laughs> uh, but it has the uh, Sarah Avenger... Sarah Avenger? Oh, the white-white the flying bird... 3-3. Three, three. Whatever. That text, that, <laughs> that can't be cast in the first, second, or third turns of the game. Now, my thought process is it might not matter if you can't cast this in the first, second, or third turns of the game if you play it in a Luris deck, which it is conveniently costed to be cast in. Um, this card isn't a haymaker and i i mean it's 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 ultimate ability is kind of like worse than playing a jace for his prodigy overall i'm gonna go on a limb and say i don't think this will see any play um but it is kind of in the niche area that you might play it if you were to play a um a luris deck though it's a I, like Maybe the, I think the blue-blue casting cost might not matter in the Luris deck if because you're not casting on the first, second, or third turn of the game anyways. So by the time you could actually cast this card, you probably have blue-blue. Um, but the effect isn't like the most powerful. You're, you're, you're looting and you're doing some free spells-ish. Uh, so I, I don't... I, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. I, I, don't, I don't see anything that makes me think this is going to be played in Vintage, but... Um, I think worth considering. Obviously, it's a you know the headline mythic of the set, uh, and it fits in Luris. So like any any card that fits in Luris, immediately you have to you have to reconsider just how good it is. <laughs> this one uh, I don't think is good for vintage for what it's worth. But but hear me out. This is definitely a card we will make a video with because it is doing an interesting and powerful thing and it is a blue card those are usually somewhat of the requirements <laughs> whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand you may cast a permanent spell with equal or lesser mana value from your hand without paying its mana cost if you don't put a, put a land from your hand onto the battlefield so lots of powerful things here for casting spells outside of your hand uh i did just reread this and found out that it's cast a permanent spell which means i can't cast see the truth which makes me very upset very, very upset. So I don't exactly know what we're going to do with this thing then. <laughs> um, I, I, I think there's something you know, there's something here. It's powerful. It's blue. So it's easy to play. You can play it in a green sense in the shell or something like that. Uh, maybe not as powerful as I would have thought it was going to be. <laughs> uh, but I'm sure we can, like, you know, casting a spell from uh, anywhere other than your hand... Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are in Vintage that already do that. Things like uh, Madness, um, Dread Return, those kind of things. The problem is a lot of those kind of cards either have a very large engine required to pull them off, or when you've cast them, you've already done the winning. Uh, maybe, yeah, so you can't, like, do a Suspend card because it's a permanent spell, huh? Because I was thinking, like, if you cast a, a, a Root Walla and then ca use it to cast, a, I don't know, an Ancestral Visions or something. So then you could play like a, a survival deck, maybe. Um, maybe. Maybe we can still play a survival deck, because at least that's a permanent spell. 
uh cares about lands has some madness creatures maybe there's something there i don't know i want to talk about this card because i think it's cool uh but yeah I'm, i wouldn't say this card's going to see a lot of play a card that may see play though this one giraffe over here with the questionable name is a monastery mentor style card it is blue which is you know we previously talked about in vintage blue cards are an upside and a downside where the blue cards can be pitched to force which is a huge upside but then they can die to pyroblast which is a huge downside nowadays there are very few pyro de blast decks in the format um a couple are making comebacks there are some breach decks that are making comebacks but like at one point when I was playing Vintage, you know, main deck Pyroblast consisted of, you know, 30% of the format or something like that. So the fact that Pyroblast is on a huge downturn uh, makes blue more of an upside than a downside. And your threat pitching to Force of Will is a huge deal. So what is this one doing? This is if you cast a spell during your turn, other than the first spell that turn, you get a zombie. So uh, it's every spell after your first spell and only on your turn so like a lot worse than a monastery mentor but you know it, it's still not that bad like a 2-2 base power zombie uh and whenever a zombie enters the battlefield all zombies oh it's only zombies that have 1-1 counters that entered the battlefield this turn okay um man every time i read this card it gets worse this is actually a really good thing for me because I I, I had some I, I reached out all these cards I'm rereading and I'm like mm, maybe not. Uh, I thought you could do spells, second spells on their turn. I thought maybe you could pump zombies that have already been on the battlefield. Neither of those are true, um, but I, I still don't think this card is bad. Uh, it's definitely not monastery mentor, uh, it, but it is blue. That's a huge consideration, and there are, unfortunately there are a lot of two colorless one blue cards that can be good like we've played lots of videos with like the chrome host seed shark and and other cards like that this kind of fits in the same style i kind of think the chrome host seed shark looks a little bit better than this card um but i know people on twitter were very very excited for this card and i and I, I understand why like uh ooh, it's also legendary so it gets bounced by other random caracas that are in the format yeah, I, I would think this card is going to be more likely to end up as a bust than a, you know, a staple. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised because it's a it's a high power game ending, easy to cast blue card. Uh, you know, like not having two blue pips is really strong because you can cast it off of all color Moxed and Soul Ring and Mana Crypt. Like if you go Mana Crypt Island, cast this, play a bunch of Moxed, play a Bobble, play a whatever... Um, you're probably going to win the game if you, you know, have a force to not die, that kind of thing. So I, I can see it. I can see it. This card is definitely worth looking out for. I would, I would say definitely try it. I, of course, will try this card. It's definitely worth trying. It's also very good in the decks that I like to play. PO style decks. This is a mentor that's blue in a PO style deck. Very, very important. So, uh, definitely a card to look out for in the new set. This card, um, I, I don't think is as good as people want it to be it's worth noting there's this new ability spree and spree works really well with dreadhorde arcanist because uh it's an additional cost so the actual casting cost of this card you know with the dreadhorde arcanist is one so you can flash it back and then you can pay the additional cost just like um shattering spree actually wait that makes so much sense okay no <laughs> um but uh I just don't think this card is good. So the main use case for this card is uh, paying the extra one to have creatures lose all abilities until end of turn. Um, it is uh, kills constructs because constructs have uh, power and toughness based on an ability. So you can kill constructs with this card, which I think is good. Um, and you could maybe, if you're more of a combo-oriented Dreadhorde Arcanist deck, thinking like um, a Breach deck, a Lurus Breach deck, um, then you could turn off collector oofs and, and stuff like that for a turn. Um, so that maybe there's something there. Uh, indestructible is not the hugest deal. The most of the removal in vintage is source of plowshares base at the moment. So lots of exiling. And then being able to wipe the board is nice to have the option, but six mana is fairly dubious. Um, uh, one thing to note is that this card this card is not going to stop a Thassa's Oracle. 
It's not like a full dress down style. Like the uh, the Thassa's Oracle will still trigger. Um, so that's definitely something to uh, to be aware of. I, I think this card probably doesn't see play, but if there is any deck that wants it, like the Dreadhorde Arcanist decks have historically, the Dreadhorde Arcanist players have complained about losing to Saga tokens, and this is another way you can beat Saga tokens. I just think it's probably worse than playing a Dress Down if that's your main goal. But your Dress Down isn't, you know, Dress Down is not flash backable with Dreadhorde Arcanist, but Dread, uh, Dress Down is, you know, returnable with Luris, so... Okay, this card, this card I'm super excited about. This card, I don't think anyone else is as excited as I am, uh, but I like Sprite Dragon. Sprite Dragon is a dope card. The problem with Sprite Dragon is Sprite Dragon is a blue and red casting cost, and the decks that want to play Sprite Dragon want to be able to cast it off of off-color Moxon. And now this card is a Sprite Dragon slash Kiln Fiend style card that is castable off of off-color Moxon, and uh, it makes me extremely excited. Uh, these kind of cards, the key when you look at these kind of cards for Vintage is they have to be triggered off of non-creature spells, not off of instants and sorceries. This is triggered off of non-creature spells, so bobbles, etc. I think it's totally possible to make a blue-red, you know, Kiln Fiend style deck uh, in Vintage with this card. We might need another threat. I'm not sure what the other threat is going to be um but maybe it is sprite dragon still uh and you just play eight of these effects but it, it, it's it's tough because the reason i don't like sprite dragon like i said it's hard to cast where this card should be a lot easier to cast you should be a four volcanic deck uh all of your mocks in will cast this plus a volcanic island um it theoretically lets you continue to play wastelands or uh, sagas in your deck and cast this card more efficiently um, I think it's probably important that you can play Wastelands or Sagas, maybe not both, because I think this card wants you to be Breach. Um, this card wants you to play Breach and Bobble, and get, cast a bunch of Bobbles to kill your opponent. Uh, I, I am excited for this card. It's po it's, it's probably probable, um, possible or probable, that this card is not a high enough power level for Vintage, uh, and that could be definitely be true. Um, but it's, it's the first one of these like style cards that is costed correctly to be very good. So, uh, I know I will be experimenting with a lot of blue, red, um, you know, burn almost decks. Uh, there's not that there's, there's creature removal in the format now, but there's still like not a lot of creature removal in this kind of card really preys on those kind of decks. So I am super excited. This is probably one of my favorite cards of the set. Also worth noting, it is a wizard. Um, I know we don't play a lot of Cavern of Souls right now because of Urza Saga and Wasteland and those things. Um, but theoretically, you could probably make a wizard version of this deck that has a cavern, and then you're like turning off their Force of Will, and you're resolving this card no matter what, and that might be good too. There's a lot of room in here. I'm very, very excited about this one. Um, however, a bird that I am not excited about... <laughs> is this uh even interrupter i saw some posts about this one um being very interesting card uh this card is not castable uh because the place that this card needs to, that would be, want to be played is in mono white initiative and mono white initiative cannot play white white cards you can try and you'll sometimes uh, i need to probably rephrase that because people get confused the probability that you'll be able to cast this in the turn that it matters is not high enough to be worth playing in your deck. This is something I say consistently about jewel shops as well. Um, your decks are not configured in a way that's going to make you reliably, to a high percentage of the time, be able to cast this spell. Um, and even then, I'm, I'm not actually sure this card like is powerful enough either. Um, but I know people were talking about this card as being exciting. Uh, I don't think this card is exciting at all. I think this card is just a uh, bulk bit rare. Maybe it's good in standard or something like that, where you can like uh, stop a wrath for a turn. That could be definitely be true. Uh, but for vintage, I, I I don't think this card has any legs or wings. Yeah, whatever. A card that I do think is good that I don't think enough people are talking about. High noon. This card is sweet. This card is. This card would not be that good if. <laughs> we didn't have a certain cat running around. I am specifically thinking that this card should be a sideboard, maybe even one main card for 
uh, Luris control decks that are in the the white uh, casting white cards. This card reads really well to me um, because this card has multi purpose and plays well with Luris. Um, this card is anti combo where you're you and your opponent are not playing more than one spell each turn. I don't think not being able to play one, more than one spell in a turn is a drawback for Luris Saga. Uh, Luris Saga is going to deploy all of its fast mana in the beginning and then play this card. And so you're not actually super worried about, you know, like having to cast more than one card a turn. And then for the rest of the game, you're usually just like casting your card from your graveyard and passing the turn, right? So I, I don't think that's a huge drawback for you, whereas it's a huge way of stopping Jewel, Pio, Breach, all of these combo decks that I think can be bad matchups for shops. For uh, Saga, I should say. Um, I think this card is great. And then you have the second ability, which is good. The second ability is Ford of Red, which is hard to do, but like not impossible to do. Uh, and you sacrifice it, and it's five damage to any target. So not only can we kill initiative creatures, constructs, uh, we can kill Leovolds, and we c it kills basically everything in the entire format. Uh, besides Atraxa, <laughs> but it also goes face. So you make it so your opponent can't pl play more than one spell on their turn. Uh, you counter their spell or whatever. At the end of turn, you use all your ton of your mana to five damage their face. You untap and you replay it with Luris. And you just loop this four times and you win the game. This could like solve the issue that like my, blue, blue White doesn't have lots of ways to win. Uh, it kills like a lot of problematic cards, <laughs> like oofs and, and archons. And I think that this card, obviously you have to work and like make the casting cost a little bit more playable. Maybe you have to play one volcanic. Maybe you have to play some kind of moxin, like an opal or something. I, I'm not like sure what the actual requirements for this is. Maybe you only want to play it if you're playing like a Jeskai colored version, which is totally doable. Um, I, I think this might be, so far, the most playable card that we've seen. Um, I'll be surprised if this doesn't pick up any play, because I think it really helps in, in some matchups that uh, Saga doesn't like, and I, we should probably be scared if uh, Saga is picking up cards that, uh, Lura Saga, I should say, is picking up cards that uh, are good to help its bad matchups, because, boy, does it not have very many bad matchups right now. Um, that's something I'm keeping an eye on as well. Uh, the last month or so of Lyra Saga has been above average in comparison to its, uh, historical performance. Um, if that can, keeps up, then, uh, we're certainly in range for the last month, if that would to last a long time, uh, of uh, being, uh, too strong of a deck. So, something to keep in mind. Uh, what do we got next? Oh, this one, I am less, I am less... I am more, <laughs> I'm leaning towards the fact, the idea that this card is probably not very playable, but I definitely think it's worth talking about. It's another one of those spree cards, um, so it plays well with Dreadheart Arcanist, uh, but it's nice little modularity here um, for Black, Black, Black off of Dark Ritual. It's a draw three, lose three, which I think is decent rate. Um, I'm trying to think of if it's like a great rate or not. Maybe it's a little bit below rate. Uh, but it has this modularity here where if you wanted to do three mana, it's a top deck tutor. Um, paying three mana for an Imperial Seal that doesn't do any damage is not really something you want to do. Uh, but it's nice that you can do it. These cards that are modular are typically, you know, the, the, the two different things they can do are lower rates than normal. But you have this ability to, um, you know, have options, which is very, very powerful in Magic. Uh, especially if you, like, have a ton of mana, right? This is uh, six mana. Sorry, five mana? Five mana, and that's a two to four card and draw three. So it's two to four card and draw two, because you're drawing the card off the top. So you're going to draw two and two to four card for if you have a bunch of mana. I, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, obviously, like it's a lot of mana to do that. Uh, you could theoretically cast a Dark Petition or something if you had that kind of mana. Um, so like, like I said, both of these options are probably below rate but the fact that you can choose them and the fact that it's a it's a one mana uh, spree card i think are worth considering i would be surprised if this sees play but i think it should be tested i would i would definitely recommend testing this kind of card in a variety of dark ritual shells uh i think there's there really still should be a dark ritual luris deck that we haven't seen any dark ritual luris decks yet 
but there's there's no reason that there can't be a dark ritual Luris deck. And if there was a dark ritual Luris deck that maybe played Dreadheart Arcanist, say it was um a Grixis colored um combo oriented dark ritual deck, then you might play this card in it, right? I, I think people are still sleeping on a Dark Ritual Luris deck, Bobcat style, maybe. Uh, I mean, you probably need to play blue cards and play Force of Will, but something along those lines. This card, also Lurisable, is hard to evaluate. But I wanted to include it because I think it's probably one of the more interesting cards in the entire set. And I th it's powerful. It's definitely powerful. So this is a, a Lurisable blue-black creature legendary and it is whenever it, which is important, or one or and or one or more other non-token creatures enter the battlefield under your control. If none of them were were cast, or no mana was spent to cast them, draw a card. Um, vintage is the format of not spending mana. Uh, so there's lots of interesting things we can do here. Technically, a hollow one that had no mana spent to cast it will draw you a card. Root wallas that were madness will draw you a card. Uh, creatures cast off Alluren, uh, would draw you a card, um, Aether Vial, um, there's a, there's a lot of things come to mind, uh, because cheating on mana cost is one of the uh, most powerful things you can do in Magic, and so this card that rewards you for cheating on mana costs, uh, I feel like it's worth considering, especially because it's a blue card, you know, you can fit it easily in your Force of Will deck. Uh, I have streamed Alluren decks in the past, and they've been fine. I'm sure this card would fit in there. I'm, like, a little more interested in... I wonder if there's, like, a blue... What about a blue survival deck? That's probably asking for a lot. Uh, but, like, Root Wallas are really uh, one of the cards that I think um, could be really good. I mean, you don't even have to... Do root wallas. You could just do um, kobolds and memnites and and zero mana costs. You could play um, some kind of cheerio style deck. Historically, cheerio style decks are pretty bad. Uh, it's hard to like have force of will. Hard to have redundancy. Maybe this helps in that sense. Uh, but you know, I, I would I would think that this card is powerful, but it would need to find a certain home. I kind of doubt that there's a like. Uh, a vintage deck that would be a mainstay of the format that would play that, like that would end up becoming uh, a mainstay of the format because of this card. But I do think that you can make a lot of viable shells with this, which I think is probably, <laughs> it's probably one of the more interesting cards from a streaming perspective and from a content perspective, deck building perspective. I imagine we'll make lots of different um, decks with this card. This one's not very interesting, but you have to I have to note it. I have to I have to tell you about it because this is a card that comes off of Urza Saga. I know you've probably heard of that Urza Saga card. Uh, this is a hasty warty boot you can take off of Urza Saga. I don't think our format is the format that is looking for this card, um, but it's worth noting. And if you are looking for this option in your Luris Saga toolbox, it now exists. So, uh, Lava Spur Boots, Pest Control. Now this is why is it so small? Uh, okay, uh, this is a powerful card. I like this card a lot. I like the idea of this card. I like how it's uh, has cycling. Um, destroy all non-land permanents with mana value one or less. Very, very powerful effect in Vintage. And when it's bad, you can cycle it. So, so far, I'm on board. I like this card. I think this card could see play. Then you look at the casting cost, and it's one white, one black. And that is so prohibitive. It is very, very hard. It's one of the worst casting costs you can think of. Uh, <laughs> maybe, like, if it was white, white, or black, black, then maybe it's worse. Um, but white and black I mean you can't cast it most of the time off of off-color Moxon. This is the same kind of problem as something like Expressive Iteration. And, uh, but Expressive Iteration, at least, is blue. Um, so, you're, so you're, you know, all of your lands in your deck are going to be blue. Whereas uh, you'll probably have half your lands in this deck be white and half of them be black and they're they're all islands kind of deal. Um, the fact that it has cycling on it is a, just a great little push towards competitive viability. You want these kind of narrow and niche cards to have the ability to be thrown away uh, for value and this card does have that. I just think that this card is unfortunately not going to see play because this casting cost doesn't really fit into the decks that want this effect. Um, which is a shame, because I think this effect is strong. 
I, I'm ho- maybe I'll be proven wrong. People to this day still play, um, you know, Expressive Iteration, Lavinia, and these decks that have extremely prohibitive mana bases to casting the card. So maybe I'm wrong. Um, but uh, I, I would I would think that this card might not see play because of its its mana cost. But it's it's a powerful effect. Don't get me wrong. Esoteric Duplicator. There's a couple of these big score uh, mythic artifacts that are um, interesting. So this one is whenever you sacrifice it or another artifact, you can pay two. And if you do, create a token that's a copy of that artifact. Um, so I, I think it's powerful. But you only get the tokens at the end step, um, which is which is a little unfortunate. It's a very solid engine, and you can and you can put a lot of mana and things into it to draw a bunch of cards to make a bunch of things. It's probably too slow, and these these are these blue artifacts have historically not been uh, super castable, even in the decks that are trying to cast them. I just think that we should be on the lookout for these like mythic rare blue artifacts because jewel exists, right? Um. I don't think you'll see you'll ever see this be played in Jewel because it's not actually like super castable. It's probably not ever better than having a PO in your deck per se. Um, I guess like theoretically, if you have your Sapphire in a workshop, this is more castable than the other one, but it doesn't do anything right away. Um, there is another. Hopefully, I'll try to find it at the end. There's another one, a uh, blue two and a blue artifact that is also very interesting. Like these cards have a lot of text; they do a lot of things. I just like don't. They, they kind of feel more like a commander card where you can, like, extract a bunch of value over time. Whereas in Vintage, you kind of want these cards to, like, be doing something extremely powerful right away. Uh, I need to zoom back out. This one does not have an English printing yet, but I think it's worth definitely worth talking about. This card is pretty strong. Um, this is a Legion Foundry. It is an artifact that enters the battlefield and deals two damage to any target, and you can tap, sack an artifact, and make golems. This is a Luris card. My god, this is a Luris card. This is a... Uh, gosh, this is just hell of a Luris card. This is like a dead weight on steroids. <laughs> um, not only does it ETB do two, two damage, but you can sack itself, assuming that this, um, translation is correct. Uh, you can sack itself and then replay it with Luris to deal four damage to something and clean, clean out of the board. You can turn your bobbles into artifact, uh, creatures. Um, I don't know if this card is good enough. The the Luris decks are pretty well-oiled machines, but this is a Luris card if I've ever seen one, and this is a really strong Luris card. Mythic Rare, Lurisable Artifact that deals with creatures and makes a uh, clock. I don't know. Th- this Between this card and the um, the Rule of Law High, uh, high Noon, maybe there's... Um, Maybe there's a red version of Luris that'll be like very played. I, I I think this card is quite strong. I would wouldn't be surprised if like it just doesn't make its way into lists, but I mean this is a card I will definitely be trying. Uh it's also worth noting that this card is an artifact, so it's actually tutorable off of Oswald from one to two. Uh and obviously uh Goblin Engineer as well. I think that's actually really important to know. Having a um, an artifact that's a shock in the Oswald deck, that's really good because the Oswald can tutor a one drop and kill an oof. Wow. Okay, that's something worth thinking about as well. This card is interesting to me. This card is very interesting to me. This card and High Noon and Slick Shot. We got a lot of red cards actually, which I think is pretty funny. Um, this card is very interesting to me. It might not see play. <laughs> I think this should be tried. I think there's a lot of... I think there's still a lot of room to build inside of Luris decks. Uh, and when I say Luris decks, that doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> because Luris decks are combo, control, uh, aggro, basically anything that you could ever imagine. Luris is just a, a deck for building restriction, not really a style. Um, but this definitely fits inside of um, a Luris deck, especially especially a, a, an Oswald toolbox deck or a, a Goblin Engineer toolbox deck. Um, very cool card. I'm excited about this card. 
And then there's the Nexus of Becoming. The Nexus of Becoming. I, I, this is probably not a good card, but it's a card we should take note. Every time that you print a Mythic Rare that is scalable artifact off of... Um, not scalable, but it, it's an artifact off of Mishra's Workshop that's easy to cast off of Mishra's Workshop or easier to cast off of Mishra's Workshop. Say so this is two Mishra's Workshops, right? You need to be aware of these card, kind of cards exist because they could definitely see play. Whoa. <laughs> Workshop players love to put random six-drop artifacts in their deck that do very powerful things. Um, this one is nice because it does something immediately uh, on your turn after you cast it, as long as it doesn't get blown up. Uh, at the beginning of combat on your turn, so if you play it in your first main phase, you draw a card. Great. And then you can exile an artifact or creature from your hand. That's going to be your whole deck very likely. And if you do, create a token that's a copy of the exile artifact, except it's a 3-3 golem in addition to its other types. So... I don't know what exactly you're doing here. You probably need to be doing... I say this, but that's not exactly true. I would think you would need to be doing something unfair uh, with this to make it worthwhile. Like you're putting in some kind of high-cost artifact that doesn't care that it's a 3-3. Three, three. Um, there's lots of those in the format. I'm, I'm sure you can find some that will be good. Um, the problem is, like, if you're trying to cheat on mana costs... Um, you already paid six mana for this card, so it's not like you're actually cheating on mana cost very much. But it is an incremental value engine because you're drawing cards. Um, you can turn non-creature artifacts into threats. Um, that could be pretty positive. Um, I don't know. <laughs> my, 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 my number one goal when I showed this card was to say, hey, this card exists. I don't believe this card <laughs> is like uh crazy good or anything but I, it exists it probably should be a video it's i mean what are we gonna do with it i don't know we're gonna do something with it maybe some kind of kci stuff i don't know but it's powerful it's clearly a powerful card so um let me just go back and find that other blue card real quick but this uh doo -doo -doo, it's on the bottom there are so many magic cards chat that get printed in a new set it is unbelievable. There is just no way. <laughs> uh, I swear there's this little blue, uh, this, this one. No, nope, that's a duplicator. No, nope, that's a helm. There's a couple other cards that people consider, but this one, this one, this one, this one. So there's also the Substitute Synthesizer. This is a two blue artifact when it enters the battlefield, scry two. Whenever another artifact with mana value three or more enters the battlefield under your control, you get a artifact creature token that is a, a saga a construct. Um, I think that this is unfortunately extremely prohibitive because it doesn't really do enough when it enters. When it enters, you just get a scry two, and then you have to cast another spell that has three or more uh, mana cost, which is very hard to do both. However, like... Most shops cards cost three or more. Uh, there's the the blue artifact from Warhammer 40k that draws a card. Uh, and it has like replicate or something like that on it where you can make copies of it. So like. If you were to have this card in play and cast the the draw card art blue artifact guy and copy it once you would get four of them. And you would draw four cards, and two of them would be XXs for artifacts. So, th like, this is a, this is a clearly a powerful effect, but the problem, like I said, is one, typically two and a blue is kind of hard to cast in a traditional workshop deck, uh, whereas, whereas, which is the place you'll have a lot of artifacts with mana value three or more. But that doesn't mean it has to be. Uh, it could definitely be in the uh, the Warhammer 40k tink Tinker deck that I put together. Um I would suspect that this is worse than playing, like, another one of the effect that you're trying to duplicate. Uh, but, the, of course, like, constructs are strong. We all know constructs are strong, so may maybe there's something there. So, yeah, I think that's all the cards that I'm inter I said I was interested in. Um, definitely the ones that I'm the most excited for are Slickshot Showoff in a Blue-Red Burn style deck. Uh, High Noon in Luris decks. Um... This card, just because I think it's super interesting, Satoru, Satoru, Ru. Uh, I think this card is super cool. And then uh, definitely the Legion Foundry, another Luris toolboxy artifact. Uh, those are the cards that I think are the most interesting. 
Let me know in the comments below cards that I may have missed that you think could be played or cards that you saw in this list that you also agree are interesting. I hope you enjoy this non-gameplay video. I typically don't make these videos anymore because the new sets don't usually have enough cards to be worth talking about. But I think this deck, uh, as you can, or this uh, set, as you can see, has a lot of cards worth talking about. Yeah, a bunch of these cards are worth talking about because they probably won't see play. Um, but the number of cards that have theoretical vintage uh, playability is higher than normal, and a lot of people ask to hear about them. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more vintage content, especially gameplay content, uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, new videos on this YouTube channel. I will see you then. Thank <laughs> you.